Coming up on this edition of The Climate Show, we're back finally for 2012. Apologies it's taken so long, but we have a great guest to come back with. We certainly do. We've got John Mashey all the way from California talking to us. He's been digging into the underbelly of denial. Also, John Cook delivers the handbook on debunking. And we've got solutions, plenty of news in there as well. It's all coming up on this edition of The Climate Show. This episode of The Climate Show is brought to you by hot-topic.co.nz sideblogs.co.nz skepticalscience.com scoop.co.nz idealog.co.nz and kiwifi Hi there and welcome along to The Climate Show, episode number 24, and we're back for 2012. It's a show all about climate politics, science, news, the debunking, and the solutions as well. My name is Glenn Williams, broadcasting from Auckland City today in a a new studio. Well, it's not really a studio, it's more like my house, actually. It's kind of like (laughs) a halfway house for The Climate Show, as it were. And of course, my co-host here, Gareth Renaudin, joining us from uh, Waipara in North Canterbury. Gareth, how are you doing? Oh, I'm very well, thank you, Glenn. And it's good to be on your big screen, actually, yeah. behind you. Yeah, yeah it's, isn't it? Yeah, um, very funky. Very funky. It's uh, something I'll talk about a little bit later on. But yes, some some um, supporters of the show um, coming on board. Um, I can't say that Samsung has been a, uh, a, a <laughs> specifically a supporter for the show, but they have um, lent me the screen just for a wee while for some stuff that I'm doing on the radio as well. But um, so that's a nice, nice Samsung. 7 Series behind us there if you're watching the video that uh, Gareth is on. Um, but yeah, we are back. I don't know. Sorry, apologies. It's taken us a wee while to get back on board. A um, bit of a slow start to 2012. I'm not sure what to blame that on. A kind of um, post-holiday blues. I don't know. I think it's quite traditional in New Zealand um, to go away for January. Um, it just happens that Glenn and I were away for January and February. Yeah. <laughs> so here we are on uh, St. David's Day, um, March the 1st the uh, national day for of my country wales who um have just won the triple crown at rugby so there's oh. there's a good there's a good thing very good news um now of course if you're um if you're brand new to the show you're coming across this show um, by accident somehow it does have a home it's called theclimateshow.com also hot-topic.co.nz and you can follow through there on everything we talk about um, all the show notes and links to the audio and video versions as well you can subscribe in iTunes or your favourite podcast player and check out the video also on the YouTube channel as well but we've got so much on today uh, Gareth uh, including a very special guest yes we have we've got a wonderful interview with John Mashey who is a Californian computer scientist, now semi-retired, who's been doing a a fantastic amount of work digging into the networks behind um, climate denial. So we've got a a very um, good interview with him coming up. Looking forward to that. Uh, We've got John Cook talking about um, the debunking handbook. And uh, we've got a bit of news to go through and a couple of interesting solutions at the end. Yeah, indeed. Right, well, um, let's get on into the news because we've got a lot to um, get through. First of all, uh, looking back at 2011. Yeah, absolutely. Um, It it was a cold, hot year or a hot, cold year. So it was um, not a record breaker. It was 11th, I think, on the uh, NASA list, on the GISS list. Sorry, 9th on the NASA um, GISS list and 11th on the NOAA list. Um, But but what it was, interestingly, was the warmest year dominated by a La Nina event. Now, La Nina is that um, cold phase of the Southern Oscillation, the the sort of great sloshing of warm and cold water around the the Pacific Basin. And when uh, there's a deep La Nina, that usually means that temperatures, global temperatures are cooler than average. Uh, When there's the opposite, which is the El Nino, um, then temperatures are warmer than average. So what you've got is a La Nina year, the warmest ever recorded. Mm. But um, you know that means that it's not been a record. It wasn't a record-breaking year. Right. Interestingly, um, the latest forecasts show uh, La Nina is on the way out, and um, I think the the New Zealand 
forecast, NIWA's forecast released um, just this morning, suggested that the um, La Nina would be over by the end of this month, by the end of March, and that we would be then moving into neutral conditions. And there's a probably better than 50% chance we'll move into El Nino, um, which is a different pattern of um, uh, world weather, if you like, based on the sloshing of this warm water around it. It's may well be not enough to make 2012 a record-breaking year, but it does mean that the, the, the pattern of weather around the globe is going to shift. And so the places that we're seeing um, extremely wet weather, um, like, for instance, Queensland, uh, where John Cook is, yeah. um, over the last two summers, they've had two wet summers in Australia. And weather, with a moving to an El Nino phase, then you will get back to um, drier summers in, on the east coast of Australia. So that's that's all happening. A um, couple of interesting sort of weathery type things have been going on. Um, that's a technical technical term there, uh, Glenn, <laughs> yeah, yeah. weathery type things. I get things. that. Um, like, like, <laughs> like our, our weathery summer, um, which has been very unsatisfactory. Yes, it has. Uh, particularly, I gather, up in Auckland. Yeah. <laughs> it's not been great in North Canterbury either, I have to tell you. But anyway, um, much of the continental USA has had quite a warm winter to date. Um, people talking about you know spring-like uh, weather in February, which is quite unusual in the colder parts of the US. But Europe had a, a very cold snap during February. Um, my daughter, who is currently um, doing an internship in Amsterdam, arrived in Amsterdam just as the cold weather hit and was able to go um, skating on the canals, which was uh, quite an unusual thing. Wow. So, yeah, they had a very, very cold snap in Europe. And what's interesting about that is that um, just in this last week, um, a paper was published linking the um, cold snaps in Europe and the US to changes in the Arctic sea ice. So... As the uh, the coverage of the Arctic sea ice decreases, um, and therefore more is more more has to freeze up in the, in the early winter, what that does is puts a, a lot of heat into the atmosphere, and this changes the atmospheric circulation pattern. It shifts the jet stream, and changes the way that um, processions of highs and lows move around the northern hemisphere, and it it'll, it allows. Um, cold air to kind of spill out of the Arctic and sometimes that will happen in the US and sometimes it'll happen in Europe and sometimes it'll happen in Russia and so on but you end up with the um, changes in the coverage of Arctic sea ice actually changing the way the the pattern of weather in the northern hemisphere moves around and creates gives you an increased likelihood if you like of these mm. these extreme cold spells so um, the, the page you've got on the video at the moment Glenn from uh, Joe Rom Joe at uh, Climate Progress Joe points out that this is actually the third paper um, published in the last year or so um, suggesting that this is a possibility in finding different mechanisms um, that are contributing but they're all related to this um, the reduction of sea ice so one of the things to watch for 2012 definitely and we'll be looking at it hopefully in the near future we'll be getting our old friend Jason Box on to talk about what happened over last summer and to look forward to this summer in the Arctic. Um, so if you're listening, Jason, don't worry, we will be calling you soon. <laughs> yeah, we very much look forward to ha having Jason back on. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, the the prospects for the Arctic sea ice over summer 2012 and then the impact on the weather in winter, Northern Hemisphere winter 2012 is going to be very interesting to follow. Hmm. And... Well, if you're watching the video stream right now, you'd uh, see that things have suddenly slightly changed. Not slightly, actually drastically changed. Suddenly I'm back in the Kiwi FM studio. Um, Gareth is where he is. Uh, but we had a few technical issues with the recording um, that we were just doing just then, uh, and we managed to lose some of it. So we're um, patching it up by um, inserting this in here, the rest of our news segment, uh, Gareth. But you, but 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 we were still doing the same stuff that we were doing. We're just doing it in a different way now. I don't know how to explain all of that. But anyway, yeah. Well, the, the content's the same, but yeah. um, Glenn, we, we, <laughs> we're doing it for the third or fourth time because of technical issues. Yeah. I was, anyway, I was trying to push so, push the limits back in the studio. But anyway, we're carrying on. So, um, and and this story actually continues on very well from what we were just talking about. A, a story that popped up in The Guardian saying that civilization faces the perfect storm of ecological and social problems. Goodness me, this is positive, not. 
<laughs> well, it kind of struck me that um, here was an example of a group of really quite respectable people. We're, we're talking about people who've won the Blue Planet Prize, which is a, um, a sort of the equivalent of the Nobel Prize um, for people who work with the environment. Um, and what they're saying is basically that society has no choice but to take dramatic action to avert a collapse of civilization. Either we will change our ways and build an entirely new kind of global society, or they will be changed for us. Now, that is a pretty strong statement. Now, <clears throat> we've talked about um, climate change as being just one symptom of um, a sort of whole range of problems that are, are facing you know, human civilization on our planet, yeah. because we're, we're simply using up um, we, we're polluting the atmosphere, we're using up our resources, we've got um, likely to have 9 billion people or more by 2050. And if all of those people um, expect to be able to live in the way that we do in the West, or um, even worse, like um, people in America do, there just simply isn't enough um, stuff on the planet to go around. No. We simply won't be able to make all that stuff. So what these guys are doing is they've produced a report um, it's part of the run-up to the Rio Plus 20 conference, which is taking place in June. And they've reviewed all of the ecological and social problems confronting the planet um, and have come up with a, a range of recommendations. And it's, um, it's fascinating. What they're saying we have to do, some of the things we have to do, is that uh, we should be replacing GDP as a measure of... Um, of, of, of our wealth. We need to take into account the natural and the built and the human and the social capital and work out how they all intersect so that, you know, economic growth is not the be all and end all of progress. Uh, we should be eliminating subsidies in, in energy and transport and agriculture. Uh, we should be tackling overconsumption in the rich world yeah. and empowering women to help the um, uh, address population pressure in, in the rest of the world. We need to transform decision-making processes to make sure that <clears throat> marginalized groups um, have, a, have a role to play. We need to conserve and value the biodiversity and our ecosystem services. We need to do much more investment in knowledge and training. So one of the, um, one of the authors is, um, I've got to check his name first, uh, it's Bob Watson, Sir Bob Watson, who's a former... Um, no, he is the chief science advisor on environmental issues to the the British government. Yeah. Um, what Bob Watson says is 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 pretty blunt. The current system is broken, said Watson. It's driving humanity to a future that's just three to five degrees Celsius warming warmer than our species has ever known, mm. and is eliminating the ecology that we depend on for our health, wealth, and senses of self. I think um, yeah, everyone's heard of peak oil, but um, really this is peak patience, isn't it? It's the it's the Earth's patience with us living on it. Uh, yeah, it's reached the end of it. It's the peak patience, and um, and this is this is kind of acknowledging that. Yeah, I think it's the it's it's not the first time these issues have been raised, but it is possibly the the most um, direct statement of the severity of the issue. Mm. Um, now I'm sure that some people will write it off as you know just sort of. Um, waving a banner before a UN conference. But in fact, when you actually sit down and look at all the factors um, in the report, uh, th you know, they're not making this stuff up. It's real. And putting it all together so that you actually see the big picture is something that we don't do often enough. It's too easy to, yeah. uh, you know, I, we focus on climate change because, you know, it's a big and important problem. Um, but there are all the other things that, that are, are combining to make it worse. And it's fair to say that one of the solutions to to um, atmospheric pollution um, is to go, going for a low carbon economy is going to mean a huge um, transition in the way that we operate our economics and our energy systems. So, you know, you throw that in as a, as a, as a really huge challenge and then add all this other stuff on top. And it's difficult not, I'm afraid, to be a bit bleak about it. Yeah. But uh, now we've got people actually saying this in a really strong way. Maybe, just maybe, some of our politicians will sit up and take notice and stop focusing on growth as the only solution for and, problems. And, that we and face. How, how big a deal is the Rio Plus Twenty conference, and, and will it uh, get some traction in the mainstream media? Do you think? Uh, I'm sure it'll get some traction in the mainstream media. I mean, big big conferences like this often do, and I mean they're celebrating the 
uh, the 20th anniversary of the first Earth Conference at Rio, um, uh, which was uh, played a key part in getting the whole sort of uh, climate change Kyoto process underway. Mm. Uh, I think it's where they signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Mm. Um, but I'm, I, <laughs> I might have to, I might have to be proved wrong on that. I'm doing that off the top of my head. But um, so it's yeah, it's a pretty big deal. Okay. And the focus is not climate change at Rio. It's it's sustainability and building a world that can um, sustain and nurture. Um, you know the the population in in, in uh, give everybody a, a quality and a value of life um what this report does is is just point out how bloody difficult that is yeah. but, right. it, but it is beginning to happen it is beginning to happen and the next little item just to sort of lighten the gloom a little bit um we often talk about china and india as being a huge issue when we talk about uh, reducing uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions to the atmosphere but they do take these issues, um, particularly uh, the sort of growth issues and the resource issues, terribly seriously. And um, I came across an item in this week's New Scientist about what they call a no-waste circular economy. And a no-waste circular economy is basically where um, the, the, the the waste from one industry is becomes the raw materials for another industry. Right. And so so that instead of resources being consumed and thrown away, what they do is they circulate through the system. It's recycling. Um, what they calculated was that, um, this is a report by um, a British think tank uh, called Chatham House, that um, a circular economy could save the European Union up to $630 billion a year in material costs, which is huge. Um, but China's already doing it. Their, their um, five-year plan, their 12th five-year plan covering 2011 to 2015, um, they will, the, the, it says that China will plan, construct and renovate various kinds of industrial parks according to the requirements of the circular economy. Huh, cool. So, so, they're, so, they're, so effectively one factory down the road could be providing the resources for um, that factory down there who could be then sending the resources um, back down to them. So. It sounds great. Yeah, and and it means it means presumably not sending stuff to landfills. Yeah. Um, you know, don't throw, don't dump that car. Um, let's recycle everything in it. And in fact, um, Renault have produced a car called the Eco Two or Eco Squared, I suppose, and they're designed so that ninety five percent of their mass can be recovered and reused. Uh, we need that sort of thinking applied to everything. You know, like my iPad, mm. <laughs> so, so that um, instead of having to you know stick it in a dump or throw it away or whatever that, that that they can actually become the raw material for a for another another product on, on this new side of story and uh, there's a picture of a, um, a man inserting some panels into something any idea of what's going on <laughs> no <he's> <laughs> i have no idea at all <laughs> uh, he could be anything, couldn't it? It, look, it might be a giant beehive. Yeah, it, it, it looks like something like that. Um, it, uh, the, the caption says China recycles big time, um, but then it doesn't yeah. say what he's recycling there. Yeah, so so yeah. If, if, if anyone knows you're watching the video stream, um, let us know in the comments. Yes, perhaps. and, and if, for those of you who are listening, listening in colour, do check the um, do check the, the links uh, in the show notes, yes. which will Indeed. enable you to see this picture. Yeah. Um, moving on to what will be our big topic of um, conversation with our um, special guest, John Mashey, uh, the, in this show, and that is the, all the news to come out that uh, the Heartland Institute um, has been meddling somewhat. Absolutely. Um, for most of, uh, most of the last couple of weeks, the, the climate web has been abuzz with um, topics to do with um, the Heartland um, Institute, which is a, a U.S. Uh, lobby group um, that's been actually at the heart of, of organized climate denial. They've organized climate conferences. They, um, it now turns out, have been paying scientists or paying um, skeptical scientists uh, quite large sums of money to do their, do their bidding. Um, and it, it began with, I got a tip off at um, a hot topic from um, our next subject, which is um, uh, our interview with John Mashey. John pointed me at some uh, Form 990 uh, reports, which indicated that New Zealand skeptics had been funded by the Heartland Institute. So I did an item about that, which was um, quite, you know, I, I thought it was quite important that this 
the, the, the New Zealand public knew that uh, seventy-five thousand odd dollars of of money had poured into New Zealand skeptic organisations. Um, that was then followed by uh, John Mashey producing a report on Fred Singer, who's a very prominent skeptic involved with um, not. He has a, a program he calls Not the IPCC. Sorry, the non international non governmental international panel on climate change. It's basically not the IPCC. Yeah, and. Um, Mashi dug into um, the, 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 the relationships between Hartland, Singer, and another group, and we'll hear more from John about <clears throat> what all that showed. So that, at the same time as Mashi's report was coming out, we then had a dump of documents from the Hartland Institute. Um, they were uh, board meeting documents, uh, plus a climate strategy document that Hartland claims was faked. And of course, everybody went um, bananas about this because here was details of, for instance, um, Bob Carter, the uh, New Zealand born Australian scientist who's very prominent in climate skeptic, uh, uh, or the dissemination of climate skeptic ideas, uh, was going to receive, um, I think, 1,667 US dollars a month um, for working on Singer's NIPCC product. Yeah project. So, um, yeah, a great deal of, of, of coverage of what those documents showed. The, the thing that most people picked up on was that Heartland were planning to um, produce a kind of education uh, curriculum, climate skeptic education curriculum, um, which got everybody threw their hands up in horror. But of course, as John Mashey's document showed, they've been doing it for, for quite some time. And then the real kicker to the tale was that um, Peter Glick, who was um, a guest of ours on the climate show, confessed to having um, obtained the documents by pretending to be a member of the Heartland Board and getting them to resend them out. Mm. So, um, and what's his status it, at the moment? Uh, he's a very low profile. He's um, taking leave of absence from the Pacific Institute, which is his um, uh, the, the organisation he works for as president of. Uh, he's withdrawn from the AGU. Uh, ethics committee and a number of other things. He's keeping a very low profile, as, as you might expect. Um, he did apologize for his actions. Um, I don't think he did the right thing. I don't think he, as a highly respected scientist, should have adopted those tactics. Um, but it, was he, is he just demonstrating the frustration, though, that climate scientists feel around the world? I think so. I mean, basically, Heartland funds people to tell lies. And uh, they the, 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 Heart, the Heartland's network has you know, basically the activities of Heartland's network and and people like Heartland have cost us probably 10 years mm. in terms of, of, of doing anything about reducing emissions because America, the USA, has is at the heart and, and should always be at the heart of doing something about the problem. And these, these groups have made it impossible for the US to play a, an active or a role in, um, in 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 our emissions reductions, global emissions reductions um, strategies. So, so I, yeah, I mean, you, and I know you you don't endorse his methods, but sometimes surely extreme um, actions are required to combat um, the opposite extreme kind of actions on the other side. Yeah, I think if we take this look at this from a journalistic view, um, I've been a journalist most of my working life. You know, there are occasions when, um, you know, a little bit of subterfuge in order to get documents that are of a great, you know, great significance to the global public is justified. I mean, it's a, you, you can argue it both ways. Um, Heartland had a right of, of uh, a right of, um, to expect that their documents would remain confidential. Nevertheless, what they documents show them to be doing is very definitely in the public interest. Mm. So, uh, Peter was, I think, uh, very frustrated about um, being unable to um, really pin these guys down. Um, and I understand his frustration. I don't defend his, his, his tactics. But nevertheless, these documents are now in the public domain. Um, there is a considerable uh, amount of hypocrisy involved because uh, Heartland were uh, very keen to disseminate the stolen emails from the Climatic Research unit, uh, unit, and they were right at the forefront of hammering away at what they dubbed Climate Gate and accusing scientists of hiding data and being fraudulent and all the rest of it. Um, and here we are, the, the, 
the boot is now on the other foot and it's Heartland that are getting the kicking. Well, mm. you know, sometimes sometimes <laughs> that may be a good thing. Yeah. Anyway. All right. So it's, it, the story will run and run, I'm sure. And our next guest, uh, uh, the first guest for 2012, John Mashey, has played a key role in digging into um, all of this material. So I'm really looking forward. To, actually, I can, I can say, can't I, since we've admitted to the fact that this bit is being pasted yeah. in afterwards, yeah. it is a bloody with John, it is. So, it's coming so stick, stick around because that's up next. But um, before uh, we bring that on, uh, I do want to thank um, Intel who have come on as an official technology partner to the climate show and uh, have helped me um, build a, um, a new system that um, I was using yesterday to start uh, the process, but it was my own sort of fumbling around that, uh, not the system itself, but my own fumbling around that has kind of um, stuffed things up there with the initial recording. But they've um, really provided the building blocks, uh, a, a brand new um, Core i7 chip, um, Extreme Edition. Normally, uh, gamers are pretty excited about this sort of stuff because it enables them to play, to play um, games at really high specs. But it's also very good for video production as well, and they provided a motherboard that goes along with it. So that's kind of the, the core, the building blocks, the hub the, of um, of the system that will be taking the climate show forward. So really thank thank uh, thank Intel for coming on board and being the official technology partner. But uh, right now, let's bring on John Mashey. Well, it's, I'd like, very much like to welcome to The Climate Show, this first show for 2012, John Mashey. Uh, John is a, will be a very familiar name to uh, people who've been following events in the uh, climate world over the last couple of months. Um, he, John is a semi-retired computer scientist who's held senior positions in many companies over the years, including working at Bell Labs. And John has, in the last few years, uh, begun to look at the kind of soft underbelly of climate denial and produced really detailed reports on the workings. So, John, what, what got you started on all this? Well, uh, I, that's an interesting and odd story. Uh, but first, I wanted to thank you for inviting me to New Zealand, even if uh, virtually. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I've had probably a dozen or more visits to New Zealand over the years and always had a great time. So um, I'm happy to, to be there, if only in spirit. So I, this is going to sound very weird, but what actually got me started was when I had finally finished up at Silicon Graphics, I ran into this book by a fellow named Bjorn Lomborg, uh, the skeptical environmentalist. And I hadn't really looked very much at that, uh, but I did, and I it sort of raised questions before I had the time to go look underneath to see what was going on. And uh, as an odd result, I got asked to be a skeptical discussant for a wonderful climate scientist named Stephen Schneider. Um, and in of all places, an electrical engineering 380 seminar at Stanford. Now, by the time I got there, I had already dug around and discovered the skeptical environmentalist uh, was neither. Uh, but that got me interested in the turf, and I started looking at uh, websites. I started reading up on the serious scientific literature. I also, on purpose, I obtained a number of the books by folks like Fred Singer and others to sort of try to understand where the skeptical side was coming from. I put together a list of outstanding objections to the main science, and then I kept crossing them off. And over the next few years, they essentially all got crossed off. So that was sort of early where I spent a lot of time learning the science and the arguments against it and eliminating the latter. Now, a major thing happened in 2007 is that I heard uh, someone speak that you might know, Naomi Oreskes. Uh, you probably know that name. Indeed. Na Naomi's been a guest on the show, John. So mm. we've, we've oh, been good. able All to right. discuss, uh, discuss her theory in detail. Oh, good. Well, um, of course, you know, Naomi, I don't know if she ever got to New Zealand, but she spent, uh, I think, at least three years as a mining uh, person over in Australia, of all things, before she came back to Stanford to do her PhD. Uh, so I heard her give a talk that was, in some sense, the genesis of her uh, and Eric Conway's book, uh, Merchants of Doubt. And she was talking about how a number of scientists, for typically ideological reasons, had gotten into the doubt creation business. 
whether that was cigarettes, uh, acid rain, uh, ozone hole, other environmental things, or uh, climate change. And that actually was a big awakening for me because I had grown pretty puzzled with why otherwise intelligent, well-educated people ended up not being able to understand the science well enough to see what was going on. So that that got me interested. I ended up um, uh, talking to Naomi some at the party after her talk. And then later that summer, uh, now this is 2007, Uh, You may recall another fellow, the Viscount Christopher Moncton. I believe he is familiar to you also. But he has not been on this show. (laughs) Oh, he has not. Oh, well, uh, just as well. Anyway, the Viscount Moncton mounted an attack on Naomi with the help of a fellow named Robert Ferguson at the so-called Science and Public Policy Institute uh, um, near Washington, D.C., and, I, you know, sort of, I was helping out uh, Tim Lambert over at Deltoid and a bunch of other people sort of track down what was going on and ended up sort of debunking that whole attack. But that was not nice. They wrote a really nasty letter to Naomi and her chancellor, and Ferguson put it out on Business Wire, uh, you know, the same day, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, that is not how you settle academic disputes. Of course, it turned out that the expert that Moncton was claiming had done research to refute her work turned out to be Moncton's endocrine surgeon back in London. And with all due respect to endocrine surgeons, generally they don't know much about climate science, and it showed. Um, Naomi actually knows something. So I ended up writing this whole process up, and as part of that, Towards the tail end, I was looking at this SPPI, and I noticed a number of names on its advisory board from all over the world, actually. And I said, I wonder who these folks are. So I made up a matrix of people versus think tanks that they were involved in. And what became very clear is there was a very tight social network that connected these people. They all were sort of together on different uh, advisory boards or boards or they ran their own or or whatever. And that actually, that matrix was the last page of the 40-page document that I wrote to to defend uh, Naomi. So right from then, I got interested in the social networks that connected the climate anti-science efforts that were going on. So um, I... I sort of thought about how you would go after that kind of network. In some sense, it's like chasing a mob. What you do is you study who talks to whom, how they're organized, you find out whatever you can, and you hope somebody makes a mistake. Hmm. And they end up rolling up mobs that way. So that's how I got interested in that, uh, that track of things. So that was 2007, 2008. Now, I don't know if you remember it, but in middle of 2008, the Viscount Moncton managed to get a paper uh, in the um, uh, American Physical Society's uh, uh, newsletter, the Forum on Physics and Society. Uh, this is middle of uh, 2008. And I, re- I remember that very well, John, and I know that to this day he insists that it was peer-reviewed. <laughs> well, it was peer-reviewed by his his peers, I guess, in the UK. It was not peer-reviewed by the editors. At least one of the editors was located nearby. I talked to him. Uh, uh, As it happened, I identified this very early. I got help from a very senior person, APS, who offered a wonderful megaphone. I warned them that they were in for a hassle. Uh, uh, I'm afraid I compared uh, uh, the Moncton to to expect to expect a barking chihuahua that lacks teeth to not, to gum your leg for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, I, I, I sometimes refer to it. There's um, a famous uh, chancellor of the Exchequer in Britain whose name is temporarily escaping me, who said it, being criticized by somebody is like being savaged by a dead sheep. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, yeah, I think I've heard that one too. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, what happened then, of course, is that FPS sort of rearranged itself. uh, And, you know, I know exactly how that thing happened, is that a physicist that the editors trusted 
gave them a list of a half a dozen people to um, to ask for the sort of con side of, of global warming. They got you know a standard description on the not the pro side but the the standard science, and they wanted the other side. Right. Well, nobody else would do it, but they uh, sent email to uh, Moncton uh, addressing him as Doctor Moncton because I think they had just assumed that he was a British physicist. They didn't happen to know. Uh, oddly, he never corrected them. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, uh, that after a while, that all settled down. Uh, but to this day, yes, he he uh, claimed that uh, it was peer reviewed, and it it definitely was not. All right, so that was two thousand eight. Now, I had been gathering data. I had this giant spreadsheet where anytime somebody signed one of these silly petitions, or they showed up as a Heartland speaker or a Heartland expert or anything else, I added names to the list. I've got about six hundred by now. And I kept adding activities and also organizations. Uh, there must there must be 30 activities that are easily visible and maybe 50 to 80 organizations. And those are worldwide. So uh, oh, the New Zealand Climate Science Coalition showed up there and the International Climate Science Coalition and uh, a bunch of others, right? Uh, yeah. un unfortunately, most of them are actually in the United States. In fact, I did a map once where I found an awful lot of the think tanks that do this oddly are within a half a block of Washington, D.C.'s K Street. Huh. I don't know if that's familiar down under. That's basically lobbyist central. And it's funny how all these science institutes just have to be in the middle of lobby land. What an odd thing. Right? Yeah. So in 2009... <laughs> What what started up was something that was a wonderful opportunity, and that was that uh, Fred Singer and Will Happer and Robert Austin and some other people uh, fired up a petition to the American Physical Society b basically to convert its standard position on climate change to a uh, we-don't-know-anything-about-anything position. The nice thing about this was that they added more names to the list every few weeks. What that let me do was track the social network that was behind this because it very much was not a grassroots effort. It was a sort of a contagion thing where something spread uh, among people. And they ended up getting about 200 signers. They published this. They, they sent letters to the Senate. They sent letters to all over the place. Um, but the nice thing was is that many of these people were professional physicists. You could find out where they had been, who they knew, who they co-wrote papers with. So you could really build a model of the social network of this. And you could list the a bunch of people and find them. So I ended up writing that report. I, I'm afraid uh, Will Happer, uh, uh, who is both a Princeton atomic physics professor, which has nothing to do with climate, but also chairman of the George Marshall Institute. And if you talk to Naomi, you probably know about that. Hmm. Absolutely. That was at the, that was the, they invented the whole merchants for doubts. Um, That's right. They? That's right. So what's curious is sometimes, uh, our Senator James Inhofe gets uh, Happer to speak uh, uh, in the Senate, and he's labeled Princeton professor. Uh, they somehow miss the fact that he's chairman of the George Marshall Institute, which is far more relevant <laughs> when he's talking about climate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, anyway, I did that. And while I was finishing the write-up on that one, the whole climate gate thing erupted. And... I ended up uh, getting involved helping Mike Mann out because uh, I'm a Penn State graduate and, um, and still known to people there. And I worked on the paper that became Crescendo to Climate Gate Cacophony that tracked uh, all these activities and organizations and people over the last few years. Also, of course, right at that same time, uh, my now friend uh, Deep Climate uh, uh, in Canada had discovered the first couple pages of the plagiarism in the Wegman report. And that was pretty now, the interesting. Wegman report, you know, the, Weg the Wegman report, let me just explain here, was commissioned by the Republicans in Congress uh, effectively to... to, to provide a review of 
uh, Michael Mann's hockey stick. Um, but what began to be uncovered was that it was put together as a hatchet job. Would that be fair? Um, e- yes, a very poor hatchet job, but a hatchet job. Uh, it yeah. it was supposedly done by expert statisticians. Well, it was actually done by uh, Ed Wegman, a brand new PhD, Yasmin Saeed, some help from some of his grad students, and a couple pages from a distinguished statistician, David Scott, that didn't have much to do with the rest of it. And turned out 35 of 91 pages were plagiarized uh, with often injected errors. There were biases, errors, uh, problems just all over the place. The science was bad. Even the statistics was bad. Uh, Deep Climate later showed that they had basically taken over uh, Steve McIntyre's uh, uh, statistics, which had an incredible 100 to 1 cherry pick in it. So b- basically, there was almost nothing in it that was right. Right. Okay. So you so, worked hard on that. I, that was that was um, the the first really high profile um, report that you produced, wasn't it? Well, uh, crescendo to climate gate cacophony in March of 2010 actually got some notice. Um, about that time was actually when I started talking to staffers in the U.S. Congress. Okay. All right. All right. I'm sorry. Obviously. Yep. Okay. So. Yep. Um, Okay, so so now what happened then was that Deep Climate had already found, you, you know, some very interesting plagiarism that would be plagiarism in anybody's book except perhaps George Mason University's, where Wegman is. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I, I there were some loose ends, though, from Crescendo. Now, that had mentioned the Wegman report, but Wegman report wasn't so much the focus of it. Uh, so there were a few loose ends. So I had noticed some oddities in the bibliography. And when I went back and looked, I, I found that ha- half of the references weren't, were never actually used. They were just there to pad. Uh, there was one completely insane reference to a 1987 ozone hole talk or, or paper by a guy who wrote uh, for tabloids and, and usually wrote about uh, perpetual motion machines and uh, psychic surgery <laughs> and things. <laughs> yeah, now, and, and and later he got into the black helicopters business. That's just nuts. <laughs> now, now this is this is in a report to Congress. Yeah. <laughs> How did it get there, John? Have you been able to work? I that have out? no idea. It's so completely insane. All I can guess is that somebody was looking looking for something to pad the the piece out to make it look more real i i don't know yeah you know that is just so far beyond crazy that i had i I can't get that far right so (laughs) anyway i I looked at that i found that their references there's a lot of gray literature there was just all kinds of bad things right all right then deep climate having found some plagiarism i thought i would just take a quick sample of the summaries of important papers which was 25 uh, uh, pages and of course you see that's a lot easier than what deep climate did because he had to find where these things came from um, the summaries you knew what they were derived from the question was were they plagiarized and yes they were basically they were cut paste and trivial edit sometimes with errors and sometimes they reversed what people said right so that all added up but by the time other things were found to 35 and 91 pages were sort of plagiarized in a way that you would fail a, 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 a undergraduate for. So that was interesting. And then what happened is I said, well, you know, there's a few other places that look odd. Well, then there were a few more places. And I ended up, of course, looking at the entire 91 page report, every page. There were only three or four pages that didn't have errors on them. And one of it was because it was blank. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that came out uh, in September. Uh, a very fine reporter at USA Today, Dan Vergano, got interested, called me up to sort of make sure that I was, was for real, ended up calling up uh, Ray Bradley, uh, whose uh, material had been uh, plagiarized, uh, the first part, and asked him if he had uh, submitted a complaint to George Mason. And for the first time, Ray said, yeah, sure. Right. In fact, he had submitted a complaint back to, in March, and then it turned out that 
Uh, well, it's the comedy of errors has been documented uh, in um, uh, the uh, the report I did called "Strange Strange uh, Inquiries at George Mason," and that got into the news in USA Today. Wegman denied everything. Uh, three. Very good plagiarism experts took one look at it and said, yeah, obvious. Right? Okay. So we now have had the end, sort of, of the, the probably the longest plagiarism investigation in academic history. Um, and amazingly, George Mason University declared that a paper that used the Wegman social network analysis work – um, was indeed plagiarism, and that Wegman should retract it and apologize. Hmm. Now, of course, Elsevier, which published it, had forced a retraction last May. All right? So it's not clear what kind of uh, penalty that is. Uh, they said they would put a, uh, a reprimand in his file. They declared that there was no plagiarism in the Wegman report. This was very curious because the one that was declared plagiarism was about a page and a half subset of a five page thing that was in the Wegman report. So it's kind of hard to understand how that can be plagiarism, but the place it came from wasn't, but George Mason somehow did this. So that story isn't quite over because turns out that George Mason university actually had a huge amount of information. They had strange scholarship in the Wegman report that I wrote. They had a, a whole lot of documentation about other plagiarisms and even falsification fabrication. And somehow they managed not to see it. So I'd say it's a see no evil hear no evil kind of circumstance. Now people might wonder why, because you know, a couple of these things they did come under an entity in the U.S. called the Office of Research uh, Integrity. Uh, uh, basically, any health-related uh, uh, research comes under them. And they take this sort of thing pretty seriously. And they actually have the power and often debar researchers from any federal funding for years. Uh, they actually have the power to debar an institution, although they've never done that. Um, you know, I, I don't. I have no idea. This might be headed in that direction. We'll see. It certainly sounds as though um, the GMU investigation was. How shall we put this politely? Um, more of Sorry. a whitewash. <laughs> more of a whitewash. No, no, it was not a... a whitewash. It was an invisible wash. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Right, I mean, well, it sort of like makes it all go away somehow. The one piece that they didn't make go away was the one that was already retracted by somebody else. Yeah. Okay. okay so well, that- now the question is, is why might that be? Well, that comes back to, um, you know, related to the last report I put out, which happened to come out on Valentine's Day, the same day that there was the release of the Heartland material. And okay, well, part of that... my 200-page uh, uh, report was about Heartland, but um, and all of its funding and all the things it's done over the years. Uh, but there were other parts. There was the uh, delightful find in the IRS Form 990s um, that Fred Singer had reported to the IRS that his chairman was Frederick Seitz, who, of course, was one of the scientists that uh, Naomi had studied. And he and the Seitz had been working an hour a week right, uh, for no pay. And this was good that he got no pay because he had been dead for two years. <laughs> I, I am amazed that um, we, Glenn and I ran through the kind of um, – Heartland leak uh, affair uh, before uh, popping over to talk to you, John. And uh, I, it amazes me that out of that document that you produced, the one that, you know, nobody seems to have picked up on that site story. But oh, that's not quite true, it turns out. But go ahead. Oh, you know, okay. I, I, because I, 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 what I would like to do in the, in the remainder of the interview is to focus on what you found out about Heartland, their funding, their charitable status, and so on. Because if you like, we've covered the other stuff before. But so, yeah, tell so me let me about... talk that it's all part of the same story, though. That was one of the things I tried to emphasize was that there was a network of family foundations and some companies that fund another network of think tanks, of which Heartland is one. The other think tanks cooperate with them. They quote each other. They write articles for each other. The effect is this giant echo chamber in which all the fake spurts are labeled distinguished experts, hmm. right? 
regardless yeah. of yeah. whether they are or not, right? And they feed each other articles for their own publications. Uh, they write for each other. It's just all interconnected, right? Um, and the point of this, and in fact, this is why I put this on page three. It wasn't just Heartland. It wasn't just Fred Singer. It wasn't just the Center for the Study of Carbon Dioxide and Global Change that's run by the IDSO family. It was the whole structure and network that was out there. And a bunch of other think tanks and other groups were mentioned, uh, you know, including a few in your part of the, uh, of the world. Um, as I recall, you did an interesting uh, article, Puppets on a String, that uh, caused some consternation down there. Absolutely. And I'd... I'd publicly like to thank you for giving me the the nod and the wink about the 990 forms because that was uh, documented evidence of funding that we'd suspected might have been coming to New Zealand but had never had any documentary proof before so well thank I you knew for that, the John. right person to send it to <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway um, I have of course before starting with the uh, crescendo uh, looked at these so-called form 990s in which uh, foundations giving money to charities have to say who they give it to. And, of course, part of this was discovering there was a, a foundation that, in effect, was a way to mask who was actually giving the money. This is a funny thing called donor's capital or donor's trust, and that's an interesting story in its own right. But let me go back to Heartland and its, its, um, its friends. So Heartland churns out a large amount of documentation. They run these funny conferences. It turns out that they send lots of newspapers, particularly targeted at legislators and other public officials in the U.S. They brag about this a lot, which, you know, public charities are kind of limited in how much lobbying they can do. And they sure look pretty close to the edge. And I read 1,700 pages of their environment and climate newsletter. And if you believe that, basically you have to reject most of modern physics and science and everything else. It's, just, it's, it's a whole alternate universe where the physics that makes the world work just doesn't work anymore. It's mm. just amazing, right? And you yes, know what? And, I saw a lot of familiar names. A lot of familiar names showed up there again and again. Um, they had a series that ran in almost every issue about satellite temperatures using two fellows named Christie and Spencer. But the odd thing was they kept saying, there's no evidence of warming, there's no evidence of warming. But I've looked at the guy's files, and you know what? The last line of each month when they do it has the warming trend. That's been in there for years. But you never saw that in Heartland's information. Um, you know, one of the big issues that came out of the, the release uh, of material was the education issue. And a lot of people were surprised at that. But I, I wasn't surprised at all because they've been trying for years. Right? I mean, they've had one thing after another done so ineptly that nobody wanted the materials. Hmm. Of course, one curious thing relating to, to Down Under is that Heartland – clearly must have paid uh, Joe Nova for the Skeptic's Handbook. I believe you're familiar with that one. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, well, they, uh, Heartland ended up giving out 14,000 copies of that to school board presidents in the United States. Do we know yeah. what, what kind of effect that, that has had at all? Well, it's hard to know, you see. Uh, there was one guy who rejected it real strongly, and Heartland wrote an article about him mocking him. <laughs> so I have no idea. I suspect most of them just got thrown away, but who can tell, right? Look, the way Heartland works with schools is to try and encourage his followers to hassle teachers. I've actually seen that firsthand with a teacher I know. And believe me, I, where I live is not a place that you'd expect – any influence like that, sure. but it only takes one a year, right, to hassle a fine science teacher. And it really is just that 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 whole um, getting back to seeds of doubt, isn't it? Really, for sure, right? Mm. Um, okay, so so anyway, it, it, they've been doing that for years. Uh, they've been doing a lot of this for years. The interesting part, of course, is the funding network that handles this. And uh, I saw very little in the latest funding that surprised me except actually for one little thing and that was they were actually getting more tobacco money than they had been uh oh 10 years ago 
And I, I mentioned the tobacco because that was a major theme, uh, b- both of Naomi's book, but what I'd been seeing. I, I had gone to this wonderful thing called the Tobacco Archives that had all of the papers from the tobacco settlements. And you can find out a lot of detail and wonderful memos that people probably wish they'd never written. So I found a lot of funding. In fact, most of these think tanks that I mentioned uh, got tobacco funding for years. And it's hard to imagine what exactly a think tank can do that's in the public interest funded by tobacco. In any case, I found the wonderful memo from uh, the Heartland president, Joe Bast, to uh, a uh, fellow at Philip Morris saying, look, I've defended Joe Camel. I don't know if you're familiar with Joe Camel, but that was the most successful campaign in U.S. history to addict children to tobacco earlier. Right? And it was terrifically successful for R.J. Reynolds. And Bast wrote this article saying how Joe Camel was innocent and then pointed at it to get more money from Philip Morris. Mm. And uh, I mean, you know, it, it doesn't have to be plainer than that. Tell me how much somebody cares about the education of children when they help tobacco companies who only exist by addicting children. Because mm. if you don't get them early, somebody else does, or they don't start. And if they start when they're adults, it's too easy to stop. So, uh, you know, that's kind of where Joe Best comes from. Uh, that's why I put a picture of Joe Camel on the front of my my report. Mm. So, John, so you, you may you've now made a complaint to the Inland Revenue Service about well, we, the we call it the Internal Revenue Service. Sorry, the, <laughs> I keep making that mistake. But the, the IRS Re- by any other name, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So you made a complaint about Heartland and their funding, and also about Fred Singer, I think, to the IRS. Yeah. Are the, are the, any sign of action on that? I haven't seen any, but then I would not expect any very quickly because uh, that's a long-term thing. My father worked for the IRS for a number of years, so I heard stories. It, it takes a while. But, uh, in fact, I hadn't planned to mention it, but a reporter asked me if I had, and I said, well, sure, you know, of course, right? Um, I mean, the whole point of that report was to identify the abuse of public charity rules by people who managed to spread untruths about science and do it tax-free. So, you know, if you you read the report, there's one section early on about allegations of violations of the public charity rules. So, you know, anybody who read that said, oh, you must have made a complaint to the IRS. Well, sure. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, look. (laughs) But but it is the case, you know, that uh, people in – uh, the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives get interested in this stuff too, right? I don't know if you've noticed, but there were two representatives who've already taken action, one of them to demand data from Heartland and the other one bringing up the fact that one of Heartland's contractors was a U.S. government employee. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so obviously this story, um, the story that you've kind of been building up to is going to carry on running for some time. Mm. But I, have you got any other kind of big, big projects on the go? Or do you see developments of this one keeping you busy for a while? Oh, I think there's some more to this story. Uh, let me tell you how this this kind of thing feels. Imagine a giant, giant twisted mess of spaghetti. And you keep pulling on pieces, and then they're hooked to other things. And and at some point, you have to take a knife and lop them off and stop there. But that doesn't mean you forget about where the other ones went. And there are all sorts of things, particularly some of the funding and who the donors are um, and uh, and everything around that. There is still a lot of work to be done there. Um, Believe me, looking at Form 990s gets really old after a while, but there's a lot of good information there. So that's one. But I, the, I, the other one. Is there anything, though, that has ever you know, actually surprised you? Because, I mean, most of the stuff we always kind of sus- suspect, um, and then when you go and find the evidence, it's confirmed. But is there anything that's actually you know, blowing you out of the water? Okay, n- not really, but, but I, I say that because... Um, 
But I have to explain a little bit how I tend to think. I tend to think in terms of probability distributions, right? You know, like this is likely, this is likelier. Uh, yeah, there could be four explanations for this, and I'm not sure what the order is. I mean, that's the way I think, right? Hmm. Um, so, so I will tell you some things that sort of confirms odd speculations. One thing I noticed in the funding is that people like ExxonMobil – were early funders. Uh, so were uh, Richard Mellon Scaife and the Koch brothers. And then they more or less dropped out. It's like they handed the ball off to uh, the family foundations and other people, right? Uh, and I think part of that was because Exxon came in for criticism of doing this. But to be honest, if you can find a bunch of rich family foundations that will fund this, uh, and you're a business, why bother? You know, sp save the money for lobbying. <laughs> so, so one of the things that was clear was there was less ExxonMobil that was visible anyway uh, for Heartland and these other guys that, than people have been thinking. And I, I think that's an, that's an interesting result, right? Um, uh, now, of course, in a lot of places, you can't find direct contributions from companies to a think tank. You can only find it from the foundations who have to report it. Uh, also, there's some amazing combinations of funding chains where you, you should never ask somebody, did ExxonMobil give you money? They'll say, no, never. Well, of course, ExxonMobil may have given money to the American Petroleum Institute, who funded some uh, conference and money flowed in through there, and then, uh, gee, somebody got a $20,000 speaker fee, right? Mm. And it's it just the, the, the potential for money obscuring is really high. So that, so that was one thing. Again, I was slightly surprised that they were still in the tobacco business even more than they, they used to be. That, that was interesting. Uh, because some of their ads, you know, their environment and climate news often had ads for their smokers lounge. I mean, <laughs> give me a break, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and they encouraged people to share articles with their kids. Come on. Right? Yeah. Uh, but that sort of died off around 2008. But uh, clearly uh, what Heartland has been doing is working hard to keep taxes on cigarettes down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, anyways, that's a surprise. Okay. Now, uh, you, you know, again, the other surprise right now, because I've sort of suspended Heartland uh, chasing uh, because there's plenty of activity, is uh, 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 sort of writing up the the end of this uh, Wegman investigation. And um, let's say there's a number of things that haven't been made public yet that will become so. Wow. And they will be excellent. Well, I, I look forward to um, to following your progress, John, because I think you've done an, First of all, you've done an amazing amount of work, and I was very impressed uh, in exchanging emails with John earlier this year, where he described himself working on massive spreadsheets and having five or six computer screens open at one time just so he could track them all, which <laughs> I thought is a very Silicon Valley way of doing Isn't things. It? But um, right. well, do remember, I used to be chief scientist at Silicon Graphics. <laughs> exactly. Uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons I was always in New Zealand, is I used to visit a certain little group near Wellington, right, who was a world-class special effects shop. Ah, so I helped yeah. plan the servers and uh, some other things for uh, a little series of movies done down there. Well, I, I, have to say, I have to say, John, that, you know, they were recruiting for The Hobbit the other day. And just looking at your picture there, <laughs> you, you could have walked into a roll. Well, I'm a little big for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, John, look, many, many thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. It's been fascinating to hear your story and, and, and your digging. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that the, the digging is going to continue. And I know that everybody who listens to this show is going to very mm. much look forward to finding out um, and following your progress and your investigations. So thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks, John. Cheers. So, great to have John Mashey on, but now we're back to the Kiwi FM studio um, um, to insert this conversation in with, um, with John Cook, who's finally back on the show. Um, we didn't have him at the end of last year because he was on a wee bit of a, a mission to North America. John Cook at Skeptical Science, welcome back. G'day, Glenn. Uh, good to be back after, what, what, two or three months? Yes, indeed. We missed him, didn't we, Gareth? 
<laughs> we did indeed. I was very jealous because John got to go to San Francisco and go to the American Geophysical Union Fall Conference, which is uh, probably the biggest earth science meeting in the world. And um, I, by the sound of it, you had a good time, John. Oh, it was it was brilliant. It was a, it was a huge geek fest, and there was just scientists wall to wall everywhere. <laughs> but but also probably the best thing about it was. Uh, uh, we tried to get as many skeptical science authors to get get into San Francisco as well. So we had a party and we all got to meet each other face to face for the first time. Great! Wow, that's re- that's excellent. Um, but we got you back on today because something that happened towards the end of last year and we missed it um, because of, because of you being away was the release of the debunking handbook. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we released it in uh, late November, just before I left for AGU. And and the purpose of the handbook was basically just to summarise the all the psychological literature about misinformation, and just pro- in, in as, as as short as possible. I think it's about a ten or eleven pages, and also just provide uh, some some practical guidelines on what communicators can do to effectively debunk misinformation. And what got you around to doing it? Well, um, it started off about. Well, a few years ago, I got an email from Steve Lewandowski, who's a psychology researcher from the University of Western Australia. And Steve sent me this research about debunking because I'd already been running skeptical science for a couple of years and I'd been debunking all these myths. And the research showed that if you don't debunk properly, you can actually reinforce the myth and, and make things worse. So at that point, I thought, well, I better, uh, I better look into this uh, a bit deeper and find out find out what all the research says about debunking and make sure that I, I do it effectively and don't make things worse. <laughs> Indeed. So are you going to run us through some, some of the main points of the book? Yeah. So, so what, we, what I did is I looked over this over the, over the last several years was I found a number of different backfire effects, which is what happens when you, you present evidence to debunk a myth and it actually reinforces the myth in people's minds. So... Uh, and so I asked Steve after a while, I said, there's all this research, has anyone collected and, and put together a practical guide? And, and no one had done it. And so, so that's why we co-wrote the handbook together. And so what we do in the book is list uh, uh, three or four different backfire effects. And the first one, and this was the one that Steve first uh, contacted me about, is a familiarity backfire effect. And what happens there? Uh, what happens here is... is Sometimes when you debunk a myth, you actually make people more familiar with the myth. And there's a, there's a general rule that the more familiar you are with a piece of information, the more likely you are to accept it as true. So there's a danger in making people more familiar with myths that you can actually reinforce them. And, and uh, um, an example, I guess, is when we started Skeptical Science, uh, we would have these long debunkings, but we'd have at the top we'd have the myth in a big bold headline, and and that's actually the worst thing you can do because because often all people remember after reading the whole page and there's all these details about the debunking, but all they'll remember is the headline, which is the myth. Huh. Yeah. Which is which is what newspapers rely on, of course. Yes. Well, I, I guess well newspapers are actually pretty good at at. Uh, identifying what the core message is that they want to get in an article and the headline will often grab people's attention and then the first couple of lines will be about that core message or the, the most important fact and then as you get further down the newspaper article the importance of the information uh, you know gets less and less the further down you get yeah so did you have to go and rewrite most of skeptical science then yeah well the first thing i had to do was go and replace all those headlines which were the myths with uh, either the core fact that I want to communicate or often just a, an open question to, uh, I guess, stimulate curiosity. And in fact, just this week, I noticed one headline, which was still a myth, so, so I went and I uh, changed that. Huh. <laughs> and, so, um, and so the lesson uh, for you was to, as you say, go and change those, those headlines. And we've got a graphic here that, I guess, demonstrates that. Um, yes, well, well, that's that's one step. But the other thing you need to do is put the emphasis in your debunking on the facts yeah. that you want to communicate, rather than the myth. With only a brief so, message on the myth. Yeah, well, well, that that brings us to the second backfire effect, which is the overkill backfire effect, mm. and that happens when you present too much information and and 
and you just overload people with too much information and and what research found was when when you overload people with too much information that can actually it's just so difficult to process all that all those extra arguments right that people people are more attracted to a simple myth than an overcomplicated debunking so so the secret here is put the emphasis on the facts but not too much emphasis just um just communicate uh, i guess as in a, as short and simple as fashion as possible the core facts that you want to communicate so the uh, just to give an audio description of the diagram we're looking at um, the you know the headline is is um, myth and then fact 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 so they come out with myth at the end we really want myth and fact 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 to come out with a fact at the end would that <laughs> Can I describe it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's one of your finest moments, Glenn. Thank I have to much. say, yes. <laughs> we didn't we didn't really need the diagram at all. I think uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> for, right. the next, for the next edition, we'll just uh, put a transcript of that part yeah. of um, <laughs> characterization. <laughs> okay, um, final um, diagram we have here for video viewers. Okay, so now assume that you negotiate all the different backfire effects. There's, there's one last psychological pitfall you have to look for, and that's the fact that when you debunk a myth, you, you create a gap in the person's understanding, or you, uh, like people have an understanding of the of how how the world works or whatever the situation is, and when you remove that myth, there's suddenly a hole in their understanding. So. If you don't fill that hole, then then the myth will just come back again. Huh. So so what you need to do is replace it with an alternative narrative or an alternate explanation. Right. So so t how do we get around this thing? I mean, I notice in um, the comments that we get at Hot Topic, and it's it's obvious around the world that um, skeptics or deniers have built themselves a kind of whole pyramid of interlocking myths that support their worldview. How, how, how can we go around kind of dismantling that whole worldview? Um, well, firstly, uh, it's interesting that you talk about this whole interlocking uh, myths because cause what I found in, like, we've built up this database of, of um, climate myths over the years, and we find that a lot of them are, uh, contradict each other. There's a lot of internal inconsistency. And, you, and you'll even see on, on a blog, they'll say one, one week they'll say it's not warming, then the next week it's warming, but it's natural cycles, and then the next week they're back to it not warming again. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's not as it's not as interlocking as as you would think, but but yeah, the worldview issue is is actually the probably the biggest backfire effect you can get, um, and and what happens there is when you present evidence that threatens a person's worldview, uh, in this in the case of climate, the worldview of um, I guess support for free markets and uh, conservative politics that, that opposes regulation of industry. And when you present evidence that says clim humans are causing climate change and we need to regulate industry, then, then that causes a, a backfire effect and people become more skeptical about the science. Mm. But the, the flip side of that is that there has been one experiment done where they presented the exact same scientific evidence that humans are causing climate change, but rather than follow up with the consequence that we need to regulate industry. Instead, they follow it up with, we need to rejuvenate the nuclear industry. And in that case, people with a conservative worldview actually became more, uh, or the, more they were more um, convinced by the scientific evidence. Mm. Okay. So in some respects, John, I mean, in, in an earlier version of this um, chat, <laughs> we, we, did, uh, we did talk about um, actually not really bothering terribly hard to convert the the people who are so locked into that worldview because they are only a fringe and that what we should be aiming to do is to address the kind of big pe the big majority of people out there in the middle who don't have very defined opinions yeah that's that's one consequence of the from the research about into backfire effects is is they find that the worldview backfire effect is, is obviously strongest with people who have a very firmly held worldview. So those that core at the extreme are, are very difficult. It will take a lot of effort to to change the mind of a person who's who's that firmly fixed in their views. So a, a lot you get a lot more bang for your buck by um, 
concentrating your communication efforts on on the undecided majority who aren't so firmly fixed in their views and who are therefore more open to the evidence. Great. Well, it's yeah, a, that's <clears throat> sorry. I was just going to say that's really interesting because uh, um, it makes it makes someone like me running a sort of topical blog, uh, even a hot topical blog, that think quite hard about you know what it is we're trying to do and and how we do it so yeah fascinating john many many thanks for that yeah yeah i mean with with skeptical science like I, i've thought have those same thoughts and and who exactly are we trying to reach and what are we trying to achieve and it's not like skeptical science is not about uh well it, i guess it, the main purpose isn't about trying to convince those diehard skeptics it's more about trying uh, i guess providing that information for the for the open-minded people who are who are genuinely seeking and and they can find answers to to these questions that they might um about climate that they might encounter on the internet and also providing resources for communicators who who are talking to these kind of people mm. yeah I, I th and i have to say it's a job that skeptical science does tremendously well uh, more power to your elbow <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, and of course the handbook is up at scepticalscience.com. Uh, link there from the front page? Uh, yeah, it's, there's a link in the right margin and there's also a short URL so people can go straight to it. Ah, right. Now, this, this tells me it's my cue to put on <laughs> my best uh, Prince Philip voice. Um, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash SKS dot TO forward slash debunk. I don't know why we let him out. I really don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> John Cook at Skeptical Science, thanks so much for coming back. We look forward to chatting to you on the next show. Cheers. Thanks, thanks see you guys. Bye-bye. Now, before we get into the solution segment of the show, I want to thank our media partners for helping us distribute the show online. That being scoop.co.nz, a daily news site in New Zealand. Uh, they feature the show in their video section. Increasingly, video and audio are becoming more important on sites like that. Also, cyblogs.co.nz, a great community of science bloggers around New Zealand, and Idealog .co.nz in the sustain section, the environmental section of their website as well. But let's get into uh, the solutions, uh, looking forward to a lower carbon future, and it's all batteries this time around, Gareth. Yes, absolutely. Batteries are, are absolutely critical to um, energy storage. Um, that's their job. I mean, a liquid fuel, petrol, really, is a, an energy storage product. And um, I want, just wanted to draw attention to a couple of battery developments that could be very significant. Um, they're very important to electric vehicles. They're also important to making renewable energy what they call dispatchable. So, you know, when the wind's not blowing, you want to be able to um, send electricity into the system. So uh, the first of these is, is a uh, process for using um, a liquid battery for an electric vehicle. Um, this is the development of a, uh, a f what's called a flow battery. So if you think about a lead acid battery, you know, one of the big car batteries, the electrolyte is the, the sort of distilled water in it, um, or the acid in it, if you like. Um, so the what a flow battery does is it takes a charged electrolyte and flows it through the, um, the battery. So if you're charging the battery, you're flowing the electrolyte through the battery, and then the charged electrolyte goes off into a tank and is stored. Right. And to discharge the battery, the electrolyte comes out of the tank, goes through the battery, electricity comes off, and the spent electrolyte goes off into another tank. So if you have, um, this is something, you know, it sounds a bit like petrol, really. Mm. So in, instead of um, uh, burning the fuel, you're discharging the fuel. Uh, the fuel itself stays inside the car. Um, flow batteries are actually being used um, increasingly. Um, look, quite a few companies are working on them. Um, they're in use with uh, wind farms, for instance, in a number of cases, and they're used to supply kind of backup um, power, some to sort of uninterruptible power supplies in some cases. So um, well, this is a, an item from Grist about um, a company called EOS Energy Storage, which claims that they can uh, discharge and recharge, uh, sorry, drain and refill a car's uh, battery tank, as it were, in only three minutes. And that would have, um, you know, we could be, eff effectively, you'd have a uh, an unlimited range for your vehicle. You just have to stop and fill it up every now and again, which is 
pretty much what we do today. So it's a it's a model that everybody understands, and it effectively does away with, if you like, range limits on on the you know the size of the battery. Maybe you don't need such a heavy battery, and so on. So these are zinc air batteries. Um, they could last up to thirty years. Uh, yeah, right. very interesting. Very cool. Now the the next thing is an improvement, um, and a lot of the time with batteries, what you get is kind of incremental improvement in the technologies. Um, you know, just in the last fifteen years or so, we've gone from, or maybe twenty years, we've gone from nickel cadmium batteries to li lithium ion batteries, and so on. Well, most of the most of the batteries that are being used in electric vehicles are actually lithium ion batteries. So the the same technology that you might find in a laptop battery or in your phone battery. Um, but this is uh, another US-based company called Envia Systems who claim that they've refined the lithium-ion battery to double its um, energy intensity, um, energy density rather. So that's up to 400 watt-hours per kilogram. Now that, if you translate that technology into um, the current sort of electric vehicle world, it means increasing the power by 50%. So the car could go 50% further. Um, or the batteries could be made smaller for an equivalent range, which reduces the weight, and makes the thing more efficient. So there's a lot going on in this area. So there are a number of areas of, of that have the potential to be um, what they call disruptive. In other words, come along and, and make things change very quickly. One of them I've been keen on, and we've talked on a lot of the time, is solar photovoltaics. There's a real prospect of um, sort of photovoltaic energy becoming really cheap, uh, much cheaper even than than um, coal power or um, fossil fuel power. Um, but the other side of that coin is having a means to store it. And although I'm not sure there's going to be a kind of disruptive breakthrough, what we are seeing with the developments in battery technology and new things coming along, but steadily improving. Right. And with 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 a, with a big push in this area, we, we, it, it's you know we could be getting somewhere hopefully very quickly. And with all that development um, being put into electric vehicles, surely some of that battery development uh, should spin off to other devices as well that we use every day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there, there's, there are a huge number of um, uh, technologies out there being worked on. Actually, bringing them to market, of course, is not quite the same thing. But mm, there is sure. a lot of exciting stuff, and we'll we'll be keeping you informed on that sort of material Indeed, as we, we go will through. On the a year. more regular basis, as well, every fortnight, I think, Gareth. Um, <laughs> going forward, we've, we've, we promise to do our best. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, technical difficulties notwithstanding. So thanks very much for um, for watching or listening to this episode of The Climate Show. It was episode number 24. Thanks very much to John Mashey as well for being our very special guest. And we look forward to hopefully Jason Box next time round. I think that's the plan. Yeah, I hope so. Um, Jason, get 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 your, get your snow boots on. We're going to be talking to you about the Arctic. Yeah. And uh, just, a, just a, a last word, Happy New Year to all our viewers and listeners. Yes, indeed. Never too late to say that. Um, don't forget you can find all the show notes up at uh, theclimateshow.com and also hot-topic.co.nz where you also find the links to subscribe to the various versions, audio or video. Uh, also facebook.com forward slash theclimateshow and twitter.com forward slash theclimateshow. Good places to um, have a conversation over there as well and subscribe. Uh, have a great two weeks, Gareth. We'll see you next time. See you soon, Glenn. Cheers, mate.